Hey people, this is DJ. And this is Ish. And, and this, this is season four, four of Better, Better Let, Let Me Tell, Tell You. We got vaccinated too early. We did. Have you seen all the free shit they're giving? I know. At Gramps, you can go and get pizza and a cocktail. Okay. And there was somewhere else that they were giving some. I was like, can we get quadruple vaccinated? Yeah, like, I j- I'll just get really safe. Like, really vaccinated. <laughs> well, with that <laughs> note, welcome, everybody, to Pero Let Me Tell You. Yes, episode 159. How is everybody? Uh, I think everybody's good. This was the first. We're, we're, we've just coming out of our first long weekend after, yes, after it's quarantine. It's officially summer. Officially summer. Oh. And people are officially out. Although... Well, out because it's summer and it's well, June and it's because bright. things are open. Oh well, yes, yes. Because things are open, yes. you things know. Are so, open. so things are open. Yeah, I mean, like I went to the beach. I went to a bar. I was yeah. like, yeah. Uh, well, was... I went to. I ended up going to Orlando, <laughs> and I feel that all of humanity decided to go to Orlando at one time and couldn't find a restaurant. Ended up eating at a Wawa, as one does. As one does. As at twelve thirty at night, because all the restaurants were either mm-hmm. either full. Clo- uh, closed or at full yeah. capacity. And for the record, it was prepackaged Wawa. It wasn't even <laughs> yes, it fresh wasn't even, deli. It wasn't even the fresh deli at Wawa because that had an hour wait at 12.30 at night, everyone. Um, so welcome, everybody. How, how was everybody's week? Uh, well, my week well, has been very good. I know. I feel like this week you and I did not have usually the contact we usually yeah. have. You know what I think it is also that like for the last couple of weeks, because... Between the show, the interviews, the the ping pong pollo, like all of it, like we were in constant contact of like, mm-hmm. did you buy the thing? Yes, but did you get this and did you get that? Right, but well, whatever. No, but like there was a lot going on and we saw each other for like four days in a row. Well, so, also, also, but you know. So now that we didn't, it feels like a so, month. So all of our friends were all in a group chat, but in all honesty, I'm the one who's like the least involved in the it's group. It's true. I, the I, other day you literally sent a text that just said, hello, dot, dot, dot. And you did I not was follow gonna, it up. I was going to follow it up with something else, but then I got busy. <laughs> But anyway, anyway. I even gave you like 10 minutes. Uh, enough about that. Um, but yeah, now they're like giving all these incentives meet up. Yes. In West Virginia, they'll give you a gun. Oh, let's go. I want they'll a gun. They'll give you a rifle. In other parts, they're giving tractors. Oh. My. Yes. How much surplus is there in these yes. states? They're giving tractors. They're giving lottery tickets. They're giving gift certificates at supermarkets, at okay. restaurants. Can we just use some of this tractor money to help with the to help with the production problem of chicken wings Um, (laughs) if they were to tell me Siorita Publix comes out giving um, gift certificates at Publix because most of my disposable income goes to Publix already that's true so it's like we 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 here we were trying to do the civic our civic duty, duty you yes know, the, the right, right thing to the right do. thing we're to do as soon as we were allowed yes you know we're we're gonna do the line we're gonna get vaccinated all these people getting all this freaking free shit. You know what? Eso pa, 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 that's what we learn. But actually, la próxima vez I wait till everybody else actually, is done. But actually, the other day I, I was watching it on, on TV. There was a conversation about this, and and CBS I, I, Sunday morning. No, it was on the View. But oh, I just, okay. I, I had a fifty-fifty shot. <laughs> I know, but it's just I now it's become a thing when I reference CBS Sunday Morning <laughs> and the View. So I don't want to be like on CBS Sunday. If it would have been a few years ago, it would have been NPR because I oh, won't point in time. I remember yeah. when every, you, were, you were all about NPR. every other thing I said was like I heard on NPR on NPR I, today. Diane Reem on NPR. Anyway, um, but I think this whole she died, thing right? about the no this whole thing about the vaccines is because while I certainly. Th- I certainly don't see why if you're eligible, you know, if, if you're eligible to get vaccinated, you mm. shouldn't. I can understand somebody who, for whatever principle, does not want to get vaccinated. Mm. Right? Okay, you don't want to get vaccinated, and you have your reasons, and they may be legitimate to you. Right? I'm, you know, if, whatever if, they are, they're your reasons. They're your reasons, whatever they are. And if you're not going to get vaccinated, vaccinated you're it. not going to vaccinate it. But I think now, if you could be like kind of like convinced with free shit, it's like they'll then how. How strong how was your adamant conviction were you? yeah. was to begin with. And, you know, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because there's a bunch of stuff we want to talk about. But, you know, there are some as, much as, I, you know as much as I love our country and, you right. know, and I'm proud to be an American, right. you know, at the same time, this is kind of like American. The epitome of. Of, of American, like we're spoiled, entitled brats. Because right. while the rest of the world 
you know, they're making has, lines for like three days. Even Europe, like in right. Europe, that you know, we're not talking about third world countries. We're talking about right. like you know, allies, first world countries in Europe, right. developed countries. You know, even in Canada, in freaking Canada, right? Like they don't have the access to vaccines that we do. Right. And here now you got to freaking bribe people with freaking tractors and vacations and lottery <laughs> tickets and donuts. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take all three. I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll, all of that. I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do I'll, a lot of things will, for a donut. I'll figure out where to put the tractor. Yeah. Um, but it's like, coño, you know, like the other, the rest of the world is like, like, there's a shortage. There's and... a shortage. There, there's like pain. And, and here we are, us entitled Americans. Like, like fine. And, and granted, again, we're not talking the, about people who are com- there's have certain people who still haven't gotten vaccinated because of lack of access. You know, there's a distrust of you know something like a vaccination among certain communities, especially right. communities of color right. who have been burned by you know yeah. previous issues with yeah. you Tuskegee. Know, anyone? Yes, and all that. Um, so I could certainly understand. There's a certain part of the populace that is weary of vaccines. Right, right. But for like everybody else, I mean, really, you need a tractor to convince you. They I mean, are even giving Uber is now. Even letting you, um, I think it's take free Uber up to like twenty five dollars. I think each. They're giving way. like free community college and scholarships. <laughs> like, why cancel the student debt if you could just get a COVID vaccine? Like, oh, they're gonna send you an edible arrangement. Like, this is the type of stuff that people over abroad look at us and be like, those freaking Americans. You know, they think the yeah. world revolves around them, and it's like it's true because it's, it's, it, it's like coño, you know, in freaking Canada, in Canada, which is America like, with. More manners. With more manners, A, a maple syrup. You know, and poutine. hockey. Poutine. And poutine. Oh, poutine. poutine. Why hasn't poutine made it to, like... It's like all of our favorite things. I think it's the name. Poutine? I think it's poutine. Because some places will have poutine, but they'll call them disco fries. Yes. But then I you mean, have... But some people don't like French disco. French fries smothered with gravy and cheese and cheese curds i, I mean, mean what is there not to like about that i mean that was created in canada but let's be honest that's american yeah that's like <laughs> clog your arteries american. That's, yeah 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 but i mean come on people like get a grip yeah. but um anyway something that i wanted to bring up uh okay. being that this is our first show in june so it's pride month happy pride everybody happy pride, everybody um th- you know i've well, last year Pride was canceled, <laughs> along with everything else. Yeah, well, Pride, Pride existed. I actually i, I sent well, i sent little cards to all of my friends across the country as a well, know, well, as you a know, way to celebrate the Pride. Events, no, no, the right, 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 um, right, right. And this year, I, I a lot of events are going through. Yeah. Are, are are going yeah. even if smaller. Wil- Wilton is having their their right. Pride event. I think later. I think it's no, later. it's this month, June nineteenth. Okay, yeah, um, we're gonna be there. But anyway. The, what I wanted to talk specifically about was that I know that the New York New York Pride, um, and I think other it's cities, happening. but spe- it is happening. But mm-hmm. the New York Pride has banned the police. Yes, from yes. being from at, being at the present, you know, present at the um, event. When I first heard this, I thought I thought about logistics. Right, I thought that. The organizers of the Pride event mm-hmm. did not want to hire. I don't know why. This is why okay. where my mind went to that. The organizers of the Pride event did mm-hmm. not want to hire the police. Mm-hmm. That they probably would hire private security because right, right. there needs to be security in Crowd such a big event. And, right. um, that they didn't want to hire the police. Right. Th- th- I don't know why. That's well, okay, what I but, thought that, of. but that's that's the logical. I thought about a logistics, right? You know, reason. But actually, when I read more into it and I looked into looked, looked into it further, they're pretty much banning police. So they're banning a lot of the different unions and um, yeah, there's a lot of people who have floats and, and floats that march, are from police march, unions yes. and from police stations that are obviously gay officers that celebrate pride or even allies, whatever. But there is a presence of police. Yes, there has yes, been a I've presence it, yeah. of police. Um, in that marches in the parade. That marches in the parade in New York City and everywhere. Yes. Um, and this year they are they're not allowed. They cannot work. See, I didn't know that. I thought it was they, just the the, they're the, not, the they're, I just thought it was the security element. No, they're not allowed. They're not invited. They're not wanted at the parade. They're well, that's, not invited. That, that's so accepting. Wow. They're not invited. Um so if you are gay and you happen to be a cop and a police officer and you're proud of being a, a gay a, a, and, open, an out and, proud, and in uniform, out proud. you can't participate because you're a cop. in the parade. And that's fucking ridiculous. And, I tried to see this from 
you know me. I always try to see both sides of the story. No, there is no both sides of the story. Well, well, no, well, well, because but, but, but let me let me let me let me say this. I, I well, not everybody knows, but for those who don't know, Pride did start with the Stonewall events in June of 1964. Correct. I don't remember no, the 1969. Yes, when Judy yes. Garland died. That's right. Yes, right. That is how Pride started, and what really was the the, yeah, what the started what actually enough. started that event on that night at the Stonewall Inn, was which a now has raid. become a, a landmark, mm-hmm. was that the that was not only was it a gay bar, but there were also a lot of um, like trans uh, men and women. Well, or it was an LGBT time, an LGBT bar, but at yes. that time we didn't use the and that, drag queens that and all that. Mm-hmm. And basically, the police was like kind of profiling different gay bars, and w- what really started the yeah. Stonewall. Wall riots, if you want to call it, was that these at that time called transvestites yep. fought back against police and yep. threw bricks, threw shoes. Yeah. Marsha P. Marsha P. Johnson is credited as as starting the, right. the riot. So I certainly understand that what started Pride was kind of like an anti-police. It was an act of rebellion. Rebellion, absolutely, specifically against the police. Absolutely, right. But the police. Uh, since then, but fifty or, years or, later, for some time now, the police and police unions and the police force has had a presence in Pride. So what I am trying to like scratch my head about. I mean, I know that the the police right now in general their stock is low, yes. especially after that summer, and we've talked in here about at length why that is, and and it mm-hmm. is correct. You right. know, it's it's it, you know the police has a history need of to abuse reevaluate and mm-hmm. need to be exactly reevaluate. And there's a hundred things wrong that need to be fixed within different police departments in the country. But I, I, and again, I'm trying to see both sides of it, but I feel that excluding, you are excluding a group of people that happen to be cops out of an event and a movement that its whole purpose is to show inclusivity. It's to show that we're everywhere. Inclusivity and acceptance, Mm -hmm. right? Right. So that's kind of what I wanted to touch on to see kind of what your views it's, were on it because I've tried to wrap my head around it. Like, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and it's it's that's why I'm saying it's bullshit because I and I've told you this before, you know, and this ties into a bigger thing with that we're currently experiencing this year with Pride that I'll I'll touch on, but the corporate sponsorship, yeah. Yep. It's that it's that bullshit thing of like you know we're oh my god be proud to be gay be proud to be gay oh no but don't be gay that way. Right. No, 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 no. Why are you why are you giving into heteronormative and and why are you being straight acting? And it's like because who I fuck? Did intersectionality come out somewhere. Don't even, in, don't even get me started on that goddamn road. But it's like, you know, who I go to bed with does not dictate how I have to act, how I have to dress, how I have to appear. If I do not feel comfortable as a gay man wearing a dress in public, you know what? So be it. I'm not going to negate you doing it if you wish to do that as a drag queen. I'm not going to negate your reality as a trans person. Like there's no, it's this, it's this thing of that. It's like, if you are. It's a one size fits all. Yeah. If you are part of the LGBT plus community, you have to act a certain way. And it's the same thing that people like, let's go back to the election where they're like, oh, you know, Latinos are not a monolith, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's this thing like, if you're Latino, then you must eat, you know, salsa. If you're black, you must do this. That's actually a really and it, it's, a good way of putting it and it's that, like that no being gay or being part of the gay community the gay community is not a monolith it's not a monolith yes you know listen i respect lady gaga as a performer not a huge fan right oh Okay, come at me, they're, little monsters. T- the little monsters are come gonna at go me. with the kitiki torches <laughs> to your house. <laughs> come at me, little monsters. You know, and and I. But just, that annoys me. That annoys me to no avail. And 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 and, and I, I I see the whole thing about cops. Are they saying that p- gay police officers are not valid members of the community? Right. And what I'm and what the way that I see it is. You know, if 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 you you know, being an officer is something that's a very male, like alpha male, right. you know, frat boy, frat boy kind of institution. Traditionally, yeah. right. So for you to be an open gay man and a cop, you, you are, know that takes a certain amount of balls. That's a to man. Do that. That's a man. Know, or a of, woman. Of, like that's a um, of courage to right, do that. Right. And for you to not now be allowed to be a cop and be proud of the work that you right. do and also be out and, and be pro, pro, you know, proud of who you are, who you are. Then I, I feel that kind of, you're missing the, the point. Mark. You're missing the point. The mark a bit. And right. I understand that. And again, maybe, maybe it's about how the conversation, again, we were not part of these conversations. Maybe 
they're I mean, again, the phrasing is that they were banned. Had they had that conversation and said, listen, we just think that maybe this year you guys should sit it out. Because what we don't want, because we understand that right now there's there's a certain feeling towards the police, and we would hate for your float or your group or whatever to come down the street and feel animosity when that is not what this parade is about. So we would, you know, we'd prefer if you maybe think it over and maybe not be part of the parade this year just because for your own consideration and your own safety, we don't want to put you in that position. Again, maybe that's a conversation that was had, but not based on what we're reading. No, I don't think. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, based, based, on, on, based on what we're reading, that, it's. This it's, was like the organizer said no. It's no. You are not allowed and, to be part here, of our community. Here's, here's my thing on it. The moment you start excluding people. Or and, and slippery slope. Stop, because then mm-hmm. next year, they could come and say, well, you know, we're not allowing people in, mil- in uniform and military to come. Because military, until very. Until right. The, don't Obama, ask, don't tell. Don't, don't ask, don't tell. Until the Obama right. administration right. just a few years ago. Right. You know, and the military stood for all these things and all that. So right. are we now not going to allow veterans and, and you know. Right. Um, Where does it end? Other people, men and women that have been in the military and have served. Right their country with pride, pride. and also have, have pride. pride in who they are <laughs> to be part of these, yeah. you know, because the thing, especially with military is that their uniform is very much a part of that. And that's something that, you know what, you and I will probably never understand because we, we didn't wear the We're uniform. not in the military. But you know, that's why they wear it when there's an event. That's why they wear it when they get married because that's very much, very symbolic of who they are, mm-hmm. right? So it's very a let's part bring, of them. Put it, put it, let's bring it a little closer to home. Let's bring it a little closer to home. You and I are Cuban American. All right. Traditionally, historically, Cuban Americans are what? Conservative Republicans. Yeah. So if right now I want to go out there and have a Cuban American float in a pride parade, are you going to come and tell me like, no, because historically your culture or right. your whatever has been, at, you know, too, too conservative and, and anti blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, so yeah, that's the problem. The moment you start, the moment you start excluding people, no matter how righteous justified or... you think you are, you are opening the door yep. to further exclusion and your intentions may be good, but you know what? The road to hell is paved with good, good intentions. intentions. That's true. And, and that's why like, I, I, again, and I, I've tried to wrap my head around this from mm-hmm. both sides and I could certainly see the argument of that is against the police. I certainly see it. I understand it. It's not the I right mean, time for them to we've be. We've talked correct. on this show at length about the problems with officers and the problem with systematic racism and systematic, you know, targeting discrimination and, and discrimination and- uh, of police, of police in general. Right, right. Um, and it's certainly an issue. Right. But again, excluding a group of people is is a problem. Yeah. And to go further on what you you said about corporate sponsorships, oh. because that's something I've I've seen a lot on my feed yes. like and, blow and, up. And I go ahead and do it, but I'm actually gonna read a, a post blow from a friend of mine. On people that are like, Oh, um, yeah, now it's June and all these big corporate sponsors, you know, will have rainbows, you know, everywhere. Right. You know, buy from local gay shops and which are local. Sure. That's great. I mean, if you want to buy from your local gay-owned store, business, what, right, right. whatever business it is, more power to you. But the counter-argument I will provide to this is as follows. Do companies do it to make money? Of course. Fine. Of look, course, look. they do it. A company is not a charity. But I think that if you are either somebody who's closeted or especially a young person, person Mm -hmm. who you're coming to terms with your sexuality and you're trying to figure things out and you're intimidated to come out whatever it may be i think to see a big corporate sponsor like nike right oreo support you come out with full-blown like pride gear right i think that gives you a sense of like you know if there's hope if, if, if 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 these huge corporations are doing it then this is not as obviously it has its obstacles in it, but you know, right, right, but it's not as taboo as, it, it, as yeah, as it, I mean, as it was. It gives you a certain amount of encouragement, right? Recognition and, that, and, and recognition, and that can mean the world mm-hmm. to someone. That can mean everything to someone. Yeah. And I think that just saying some a blanket statement like "oh, you know, boycott like big companies that have you know pride stuff," right. that's really dismissing. No, it, 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 it's myopic. It's dismissing, it's dismissing the value that can have to a lot of people. And also, which is the last thing I'll say about that, <laughs> is that, you know, well, 
gay being gay nowadays is not what it used to be. Like most people in this country are okay with it. Most people agree. know at least one person who's openly gay. Yeah, yeah. and it's, most it's, pe- and most Americans right. by majority, it is not like a a fifty fifty one. Right, you know the majority. I think it's like seventy some percent. Yeah, um, just don't care. It, at the end of the day, well, they they agree they are for but that's, um, but, equal marriage. So this is this is something that there's still a lot of work to be done. Right. But it's something that we as a as a country have made strides in. Right. But I do think that whatever it is, whether in this topic we're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, pride and and being gay, I I, I do think that famili- familiarity and. Yeah leads to a certain amount of acceptance. And I think that yeah. when people see big corporations, big, you know, uh, big shows, you know, whether Brands, it's, it's yeah. uh, all these like really mainstream staples, right. not only embrace pride, but go out of their way to like celebrate pride. Right. Because in a lot of shows now, pride is celebrated like Black History Month. Like, oh yeah, a lot of channels like, have a pri- like pride like on air promos. Like and, on the yeah. View, they now yeah. have. I don't know if they're doing it this year because of the pandemic; it's all messed up. But they they always have like what they have on on Black History Month. Like oh, yeah. today in Pride history, so and so was the first LGBT person to blah yeah. blah blah blah. And blah, like blah, they blah. did for Hispanic Heritage Month, which you know they did it because of you, as we established. Yes, right. <laughs> Last year, yes. Um, I think that goes a long way. And I think that yeah. that is one of the many ways, it's not the only way, right. that people become accustomed to what right. they see. And a lot of times when people people are afraid of what they don't see or don't understand or are not familiar with. Yeah. So becoming familiar with something is one of the many forms of, of acceptance, acceptance yeah. and of, of moving on. Yeah. So I just, you know, I think that this is one of these topics that there's certain people that want to um, dictate. And want to steal the narrative? It's it's just, it's like I've said, it's this thing of like, you know, oh my God, we need to be accepted. We need to be accepted. And then the corporations come out and they're like, no, but that's not how you accept. It. Well, uh, what do you, okay, what do you want? Because yeah. the fact that they're recognizing you, you know what? Of course they want your money. They're a business. They're not in it for volunteerism, you know? And I will say, I teared up a little bit this week because, um, again, as a child of the 80s, you know, we were very into He-Man, uh, Masters of the Universe. And I follow their... The Masters of the Universe, the official Masters of the Universe uh, Instagram profile. And on June 1st, what they did was they took uh, an image of the, He-Man, oh, yeah. of the He-Man sword. Oh, yeah, the sword. And they did it as the pride, yeah. as, you know, as the pride flag. Like, You know what? That As a kid who grew up in the 80s before any, you know, there was this widespread acceptance or whatever. To see a brand that I grew up with that I loved as a child embrace, embrace yeah. that. Mm-hmm. You know what? That means a lot to me. Yes. And, that and, hit me in all and, the fields. Yes. And, you know? and you are a full grown adult. Imagine if you again are an adolescent. Right. You know, and you are, you know, you're not sure on things. You're, you're going through to figure stuff. Yeah. It out. That means the world to people. Because you know what? When, when, you, when you are there in your room and you think that, you know, people aren't going to accept you. And you think that, you know, the world is against you. And Konyo, you see freaking Nike come out yeah. with a pride shoe. Yeah. You know, that may be very tangible and very fluffy. But it's like Konyo. But there's a weight to it. Yes. That there is, is a like, weight to it. Th- that didn't exist when we were kids. No, no. And it's not like we were yeah. kids, you know, generations ago. Right. You know, we were kids in the 90s, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's not like that did not exist as At all. early as, n- not even the early 2000s that existed, you know. I mean, it's, got, it's, level, it's gotten better progressively every 10 years or so. But yeah, 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 yeah. So I think people need to, like, just, <laughs> just shut, shut up and up. let people do do you, you know. Embrace. If you want to buy the Nike pride shoes, buy them. If you don't want to buy them, don't buy them. Don't, yeah. If you want to buy soap from the local lesbian store, then go and buy it. And lesbians do make the best soap. I know, right? They do. <laughs> it's just their thing. Those ladies know how to whittle. <laughs> they do. Oh. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> Pero. Yes. Something else I kind oh. of wanted to touch upon. Um because this is something that um, I feel that in the last few years, Mm -hmm. every year it's gotten a little bit more attention. And it's, it's one of those things that like the world music awards. Yes. (laughs) Finally, we're talking about Prince. Uh, Okay. Is the world world music awards even going on? I'm sure he still gives them out. (laughs) If I was a Prince, I would. (laughs) Well, that's true. (laughs) You know who probably has gone to the World Music Awards? Rita Ora. No. 
Juan Patron. But that we'll leave that to another conversation. <laughs> but something I wanted to mention just bri not briefly, but just recognize it is right. that um, this week was also the uh, 100th uh, year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. That's correct. And if you don't know what the Tulsa Massacre is of 1921... We don't fault you. Don't feel too bad. Um, I learned something, about it like maybe five years ago. It's something that only in the last few years... Mm -hmm. um, it's been talked about, um, yeah. especially on a national level. Yeah. If you but, saw the, the Watchmen miniseries on HBO, it actually starts with that. Yeah? Yeah. And so basically what the Tulsa race massacres were was there was this incident in in Tulsa. It wasn't actually in Tulsa. Tulsa. It was like a, a little like a, suburb yeah. off Tulsa. It was, that was where, the, the Black Wall Street, right? Yes, where I think... I think was it Evanston or Edgartown? Um, I, I forgot the name now, but it was a suburb of Tulsa. Um, that there was supposedly a situation where allegedly a young black man assaulted a right. white woman in an elevator. Yes, which was later found not to be yeah, to be false. To be false. And what happened was that he was arrested, and, and he, he was, was a kid. He was a kid. Um, he was arrested. He was. They took him to the, the courthouse or whatever, and a um, a mob formed overnight. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, the mob was bigger. And late afternoon, the mob was bigger As, and bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger. And before you knew it, it was thousands of people. So then, these people, mm -hmm. white mob, a that's, white mob, let's be, yes, let's be a clear. white mob. Let's be clear. Um, later, the the. The suburb we're talking about of Tulsa was a very, very successful uh, black neighborhood, which they called the Black Wall Street because it was the epicenter of a lot of very successful black owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, there were they made a lot of money. Yeah, they, they, they were there was again, prosperity. Very successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you have to remember that this was in the 1920s. So this was only 60 years off of the Civil War, which is nothing. Um, and here was this flourishing yeah. uh, black uh, neighborhood or black part of the town. Upwardly mobile. That um, this mob went and Acabo. decimated. Acabo. And they killed several people were, were violently murdered. And they, they burned the houses down, burned the buildings down. I mean, the, the, the neighborhood was left in ruins. Um, yes. The, like, I mean, the there was nothing was left. Yeah. And over something that not only turned out to be false, but even if, even if it was true, like even if, right, right. let's, 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 true. let's it was true. Um, it doesn't that, that's matter. That's not you know? a react. That's not the proper and, reaction. Yeah. And all the, you know, the black families, they had to flee. Yeah. Cause I mean, they, yeah, they were going to yeah, kill yeah. them. They had to flee. Um, and this was thrown under the rug for a century. Yeah. For almost a century. And and I think it's very important for people to know this because whenever people go and say, oh, uh, you know, systematic racism doesn't exist in this country. Right. The Civil War happened 150 years ago, right, blah, right. blah, blah. Yes, the Civil War did happen over 150 yes, um, years ago. But systematic racism. There's ramifications got, for that stuff, people. Uh, was a problem. Uh, it continues to be a problem. Yeah. And look at this situation where an entire town was decimated um, because of... And let's be honest. The quote-unquote reason was, you know, the, the, the kid who was accused of, of assaulting a white woman. Yeah. But let's call it what it is. The reality of it is this also may have... There was an overlay because this was a successful black. Oh, of course, of course, they wanted to quash them. They were not going to have black people be successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted to quash. They were. Them. It, they were not going to let so, that happen. So you know when that's why I always tell people like, you know that people that are very quick to make judgments as to race relations in our country. Right. Um, you know, it's not in, that in simple, modern, peeps. <laughs> it's not that simple, and you really have to know and understand American history in a totality to really know yeah. why we continue to have the problems yeah. that we have. And because as we know, American history has been not whitewashed. To, yeah, to borrow a phrase, whitewashed. Yeah. Well, it has been whitewashed, yeah. but even so, we're to your point. But, but almost a hundred years but, later, but even, we're even, now finding even out with very this. well known events. 
you know, from slavery to the Civil War to Jim Crow to now the right. Tulsa Massacre to many, many, many other. In between, yeah. You know, in that book that I, I've read, Cast, mm -hmm. you know, there is a there's a part in the book that they talk about. The, the subject is about water. And I'm like, like water? Drinking water? No. How, like... You know, black Americans were not allowed to go to the beach and they were not allowed to go to municipal swimming pools and how there were people who were lynched and were like killed mm -hmm. and dragged because they want to go swimming in their town swimming pool and how they give the story of this little boy who had just w been part of a winning li li um, little league team mm -hmm. and the li little league team, which I imagine was predominantly white and he was probably the mm -hmm. only black little boy, um, they went to celebrate at this pool. Mm -hmm. and he couldn't go inside the pool so then the own you know the coaches kind of spoke to the lifeguards and were like right. please you know we won and, and yeah but whatever. Right, right. so they had to get everybody outside of the pool they put him on a raft and put him around the pool and he couldn't touch the water because if you touch the water you could you know like in the Halle Berry movie Dar Dorothy Dangerich you would you would contaminate it do you remember, right? that, do you remember that scene no you know I never saw the movie I never saw the movie, but I saw the one scene where she's, she, you know, Dorothy Dandridge was a huge star, but of course during segregation and she goes to this one hotel and she goes out and they're like, Oh, Miss Dandridge, you can't be out here. You know, that whole thing, whatever. And she literally, she gets pissed off and she's fed up and she goes and she just dips her toe in the pool and she, and she's like, I guess now you have to drain it. Well, there we go. <laughs> so those are the things that people have to know. And look, it, it, this type of history it exists everywhere because look here in, in Miami, in the heart of 8th Street of Little Havana, right by mm -hmm. Azucar and Ball and Chain, there is a building, and I forgot the name of the building now, but it's one of the buildings right off of 8th Street yeah. by Azucar and Ball and Chain. I think it's called the Victor Hotel or Victory Hotel. Okay, I know the hotel you're talking about because they had an event there. Right. So the history with that hotel, that building was that that used to be a hotel. And in the 1920s, 30s, and, and well, before the Civil Rights Act of yeah, 1964, yeah, yeah. Uh, people often forget that Miami Beach is a separate city and yes. municipality yeah. from Miami. So they have their own um, rules. rules. So at that time, prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, if you were black and you were an entertainer in Miami Beach, and we're talking about like Ray Charles, Sammy, Sammy Davis, Davis Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we're talking Dizzy about... Dizzy Gillespie. Like, like, we're like, iconic yeah, yeah, yeah. names. If you went to the beautiful Fountain Blue... You could and perform. You, entertained, you would perform... You, you, they would love you. You could perform, but you could not stay at a hotel in the city of Miami yep. Beach. You had to go. So you had to go and stay in the city of Miami. And there's this building again. Um, it's right there off of 8th Street. I think they're renovating it. That um, used to be a hotel. And a lot of, of these black entertainers and performers stayed there because they weren't allowed to. I think that's actually the setting for One Night in Miami. The Regina King movie? Yes. Which I, I want to see, but I have not seen. I believe that I hotel is the setting. Seen. Um, and this is something that is right in our backyard. And eventually, so that that most, that most people don't know the history of that building. Yeah. So that's why I always tell people when they're kind of like have comments about race, you know, the race relations right, right. in our country. It's like you really have to know American history and know what we've been through to really understand where we are today. And, yeah. you know, it's 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 a complicated and hard reality, but it is what it is, you know. Yeah. Well. There's no way for for me to segue into today's no, guests really from that, is. but I will say you know one of today's guests stars on a on a primetime sitcom that has two Latina leads, so there's there's representation, uh, there's you know progress. Um, this week our guests are Melissa Fumero and David Fumero, and as you say within like I think the first five minutes, they are our first married couple guests, our first married couple that we've ever had on the show. Um, you know I'm sure you know Melissa Fumero from. Brooklyn Nine Nine, uh, as well as many other things, and David Fumero, of course, he's an actor, but he's also a very iconic model. Um, he's the, and we get into this. He was part of the Jean Paul Gaultier La Mail, and um, it's just like, and also <laughs> featured in a video that may or may not star DJ's favorite. Uh, songstress and if you ever. listen to 159 and, and episodes, you don't know who that is you don't, you don't know who that is yeah it's mal. So, so, <laughs> so yeah it was a great conversation and so without further ado we have melissa and david fumero this is a public service announcement from the organization fathers who want better gifts hey all dj here 
on behalf of all the dads this Father's Day, I'm here to say we want better gifts. We want better gifts. Come on. We all love being the best dad, but do we really need a mug telling us so? Or better yet, a tie. Thanks to quarantine, people are barely wearing pants, much less formal wear. Come on. But you know what makes a great gift? A pair of the perfect jeans. No, no, no. That's really their name. The perfect jean. These soft, stretchy, and durable jeans come in several fits and use high-quality materials and techniques. And let's face it, most of us dads gained a few pounds during COVID, so we could use a little room in our pants these days. And the best thing about giving the perfect jeans for Father's Day, you can save cash while doing it. Visit theperfectgene.nyc today and use PERO20 for 20% off your first order. That's right. Dad will be proud you save 20% using PERO20 on his gift. So this Father's Day, get your perfect dad or dad figure, the perfect gene, and use code PERO20 for 20% off your first order. Happy Father's Day. All right, mi gente. So, as we mentioned, we have with us today two Cuban-American actors, creators, parents, quite frankly, one of the most damn attractive couples I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> we have with Wait. us Melissa and David Fumero. Thank you guys for joining us so much. Welcome to Better Let Me Tell You. Thank, thank you, you for thank having you. us. Thank you for having us. I don't think, actually, I don't think, no, I know. We have never had a married couple um, as guests of the show, so you're the first. Yes. <laughs> 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 I love it. I love it. So, you know, again, thank you guys for, for joining us. Um, you know, now that he said married couple, I guess, you know, let's touch base on that just for a moment. You guys have been together for, for a bit now. Um, I know you guys met, uh, you were both on One Life to Live at the time, right? When, yeah. when you yeah. met. Now, what are the odds that two Cuban-American actors would be on the same novela and then meet and fall in love? It, it was it was funny when I was when I first got the job, my dad was on the computer and he was like looking up. That's like what like as soon as I book something, he like looks it up on the Internet, you know. And so he, I remember he was like in our basement. I was at my parents house in Jersey and I just hear from the basement like, hey, there's a Cuban guy on your show. And I was like, what? <laughs> Like, with a heavier accent. With a heavier accent, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, was that the first time you ever heard of him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, but then when I started, he wasn't, he had left and he wasn't, he came yeah. like a year later. And when he was coming back, he was like, David Fumero's coming back. It was yeah. like, there was buzz in the hallways. And I was like, oh. And then it was like, he's a player, which he's not, but he had it a- was, it was, it was, it was face because my side of the story is I was in LA and I turned on the TV one day. I was like, let me see what these guys are up to. Cause I had been on and off on the soap mm -hmm. and I turn on the TV <clears throat> and I see her on camera. So right away I pick up the phone and I call a, a friend of mine who's a director on the show and I say, who's this new girl? Who's she playing? What, what, what's going on? Where, where, where's she from? Where, you know, tell me everything. <laughs> and she said, oh, she's Cuban, you know? I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah, but she has a boyfriend. I was like, ah, all right. So that later on, a couple months, three, four, five months later, I, I, they asked me back on the show. I go back. My first day in the makeup room, she was sitting in a makeup chair. Wow. First thing I said, I went up to her talking in Spanish, you know, like, Juanito, hey, what's up, hey? what's your name? I heard you're Cuban, all in Spanish. And she turns and looks at me, she goes, I don't speak Spanish. I'm like, what? <laughs> because I Jer had been Jersey told Cuban, man, Jersey Cuban. No, because I had been told he was a player, so I was ah, like, oh, here he okay. comes, China, China. Ito. And I was like, no. <laughs> what the <laughs> Uh, that's a pretty good story. That's a great story. Um, so now that we're talking about a, a little bit about your past in the, in the soap opera, you know, I, I don't think we've ever had anybody who's been on a soap opera before on the show. I've always been really curious as to the shooting schedules for soap operas yeah. because, like, that's the amount of content that is produced is, like, insane. So tell us a little bit about how, how is the process? Yeah, well, we do, like, 100 pages a day. We did, right? Jesus. Yeah, and pages. there are no read-throughs. You just, you have, like, a little cubby, and they just stick your scripts in there, and then... A week before. But you you shoot, like, six episodes a week. So you're shooting, like, different parts of different episodes all the time. 
And so you just go to your little cubby and you like get all your script pages. And then it really is that like actor trope of like bullshit, 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 my line, my line. And you just like take out your scenes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sometimes I wouldn't even read the whole script because there just would be a lot going on. And I didn't need to know what was happening in the other scenes. That must have been great when she watched the episode. She must have watched episodes later and been like, huh, so-and-so's dead now. Good to know. Yeah, sometimes. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, and then I would say the average was, like, 30 pages a day. I did, well, I did like, I did like 50-something pages one day. Oh, no. I mean, it's it, it's so... I think my record was, like, 80-something. It was insane. So much, and it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does happen, it's so much that at, at some points in between when you're acting, you really don't know what you're saying. You just say <laughs> words, you know yeah. what I mean? And a lot of the time, and soaps don't really move... They either move really fast in story or they don't move. A lot of repetition. So it's a lot of repetition. And it's harder to memorize when things don't move forward. It's but not you exactly know. Shakespeare either. So, you know. you don't shoot chronologically. Like, as you said, you shoot, like, pieces here and there. And then they... You, you, you don't shoot necessarily chronologically within the day. But you do shoot the same episode. Sometimes you'll shoot one episode. Most of the time it's chronologically. But sometimes, depending on the actors that go in before and after... Mm-hmm. But um, in a week of five days, we'll shoot five episodes plus pieces of like two more. It's a lot of work. And, and soap actors, man, they don't, they don't get enough credit, man. I it's have tough. mad respect for soap actors. Just, I mean, because it's, it's one tough. take. Like what you see, that's one take. Yeah. So really? If you go past two, it's like you're taking up time. Well, when I first started, when I first started, you, you go through it in the morning, then you have a dress rehearsal. No, then you have a blocking, then you have a dress rehearsal, then you shoot it. By the time you got there, you you go through it in the morning, you get up on set, you block shoot. Yeah. So they basically tell you where to stand, and then, okay, let's go, let's shoot it. it. And ideally, you get it the first take. If you go more than two times, you know. I literally watched a girl and... get fired once. She took, like, 13 takes. She kept forgetting her line. I was so young, and I felt like I was going to have an anxiety attack because I was like, oh, my God, she's... They're going to fire her. They're going to fire her. Like, yeah, it just felt so bad. She was gone the next day. Well, yeah. you can't. You, you you have to get things done because there's so much material to get to get through the right. day. You can't, yeah. you know. They don't care. They just want to get it done. And That's every- why I was really curious about it because Ish and I went uh, in 2019. We were lucky enough to be invited to uh, taping a Fuller House on um, from Netflix, you know. And it took all day to do a half hour show like all day and they've been rehearsing all week yes and they did like the, they would shoot everything what was it four times even if it wasn't like a mess up they'd shoot every every scene like four times and i'm thinking like yeah like soap operas you know five days a week uh an hour you don't have like a season it's just a, oh it is i mean for my first film years and years ago my first film when i was on the show i remember doing the first scene and being like, that's it? Oh, we'll do it again. We'll do this shot. We'll do the same scene, like, you know, five different times from different... And it was, a, it was an independence, and it had to move fast. But still, their fast, to me, was, like... Yeah. And- slow. You know, like, come on, let's get the scene done, because you're so used to the... You know? That's crazy. So... Uh, now, because, you know, we brought up sitcoms, obviously, Melissa, you know, you're on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, you know, the character of Amy... Uh, Santiago, right? Is, la- is her mm-hmm. last name? Yeah. I freaking love your character. Your character is uh, like so many girls that I went to school with. Um, yeah. li- literally because, you know, the, just not just a personality, but because you're Cuban American and we're from Miami. So, you know, was that always the the goal? Was the, the character always going to be Latina? Was she always going to be Cuban American? Or is that something that as they kind of went through the process, they're like, okay, she's Latina. And then when we land the right person for the role, we'll, you know, see where that goes. I mean, in general, they sort of, you know, uh, casted Brooklyn with the people they really wanted. Um, And Amy was, I remember, I think it was like Latina or open ethnicity. Like there, I think there was like something about her being Latina in the in the character breakdown. But I remember even when I went for the screen test kind of seeing um, not just Latinas, you know, um, the character of Rosa was actually open because like Chelsea Peretti and Stephanie Beatrice both auditioned for that role. And then they ended up writing Gina for Chelsea and making Rosa, they changed the name. I think 
in the for the audition it was like Megan or something and they changed it to Rosa Diaz for Stephanie yeah and then after I cast it they made her Cuban American because I'm Cuban so um they didn't have that specified first it became that because of me and and honestly, like, it's also, especially thinking about eight years ago, like, we forget sometimes how much has changed in a great way in terms of representation. But when we the show first started, the amount of Latinas I heard from that were like, oh, my God, I've never seen a Latina who's book smart, who's dorky, who can't dance, who's socially awkward, who's not, like, spicy or, like, doing oh, any of these spicy. stereotypes or tropes, you know, like... She can't even freaking dance. Like, um, was just. And Melissa's a dancer, and <laughs> so that's like hard to play. Like I was the gonna, I, I was gonna say because I mean, David, I know that you you were born in Cuba, so I'm assuming you can dance, and I'm you know I would hate to think you know a mismatched yeah. couple. No, in that yeah. way. no, we love to dance. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. She's no, like no, no, no. si acaso, I'm just saying, you know. Por si acaso. <laughs> But for representation's sake, <laughs> I definitely knew that, you know, shout out to the Latinas who can't dance, who have trouble. Um, but yeah, so it was, and it was so moving, you know, like it's, you, um, you don't realize, especially with young women, like how starved they can be for a certain character until you sort of fill that void. And, and then it's, it's really, a, it's emotional and inspiring to hear the response from that. Yeah. And Something in Brooklyn, really... we get two Latinas. We get, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's you know, it's embarrassing. I know. We were like, they're gonna fire one of us. Like the reason Stephanie's hair is wavy on the show and mine is straight is because we were nobody told us to do this. By the way, we were so scared of getting fired, we couldn't believe they were letting two Latinas on a network show. That before our first, like, you have a big uh, table read when you're picked up to series for the whole like network and studio, and it's like fifty people. It's so intimidating for a table read. And we were like, I was like, I think, I think we should wear our hair different. And Stephanie was like, yeah, absolutely. She's, and, and she was like, I have trouble getting my hair straight. I was like, I don't. So I'll do straight hair. Do straight hair. Yeah, like, and that'll be it. No that'll one be it. asked us to do that, but we were so scared. We were like, we have to look as different as possible. Straight hair, curly hair. So something I, I love the show um, and something I've always been curious about that, you know, that entourage, that ensemble is, you know, I, I'm like a huge fan of Andy Samberg. I, I was on SNL. I loved uh, Lonely Island. I, I, do you guys, like, I, I assume, but I may be wrong, that, like, working with all these people must be, like, a riot. Like, how, how fun is it? Or, or are you guys totally, like, just very professional and nobody cracks jokes? Like, how's that set? <laughs> You could say because you when you were there when you guest starred. Yeah, it's the most chillest, funnest. You know, a bunch of friends <laughs> we're just hanging fun out, all day. having fun, making See, each other laugh. Yeah, yeah, I was in. The, I was there for a day. I was so intimidated, so scared. But you know, I mean, I'm her husband. And everybody was really nice to me. And then you sit there and you watch how the machine works, and it's you. It's a bunch of kids having fun, you know, and and trying to make things funnier and funnier. And it's it's awesome. Awesome energy. Yeah, we awesome kind we do. We spend a large part of the day laughing and making each other laugh. Um, That's awesome. Because so many times with like comedies, you hear like uh, different actors or just comedians that they're very temperamental and all this, and it's like, oh, you know, obviously your personal life is your personal life, but you know, sometimes it's like you. There's a part of me that wishes that's how they really were in in, in real life. So yeah, so. and you know, it's like it's a trickle down kind of thing. It starts at the top and. We're just lucky that Andy is a, the loveliest person, is the nicest person, is warm and open, makes everyone feel welcome, and is really professional and, you know, wants to add to every scene and make it funnier and is inclusive in that process. Mm -hmm. And so when you're lead actors like that, like, nobody can be a dick. You know what I mean? Right. Like, everyone's got to fall in line. and. We just got lucky that this cast gelled from day one, and and you yeah. know we really are like a little family. I mean, I was I was I was so scared when I when I worked on on uh, Brooklyn that I remember Andy. There was one line I said, and Andy uh, came up to me. He's like, you know, it's really funny the way you're saying that line. And I looked at him, and I didn't even. I, I was so locked that I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because my breath is just finished. It's cool, thanks. And then I'm thinking, Andy Samberg thought I was funny. I better do it like that again. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> so 
I, I wanna, I do wanna ask you about your your latest uh, project, uh, Melissa, which is your your voicing a character on Modok. But before I do that, I actually wanted to, you know, you guys are parents now, and again, being the first married couple that we have, and you're both Cuban, Cuban American. <laughs> Do you guys ever find yourselves just looking at your kid, just being like, "Carajo, chiquito!" I told you. Not to, like, do you? It, 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 she's point, she's pointing at David. She's pointing at David. Do you? Because again, I know Dave, Again, David, I, I got I, them I, used to when, you know, when they were tod- when they were like toddlers and just started walking. I got them used to like, "Quinto te quiere que tu eres, bro." They get delinquent. They chat by I got them used to that kind of stuff because I don't want you know when he got older, I didn't want him to be offended by his dad. But I'm like, you know, these are certain things that. I have to let out of myself to be yes. really Cuban, especially living in LA. I don't know a lot of, I mean, a lot of Cubans here. Was, it's not like Miami, you know? I was going to say, like, because you, you, you came to this country, how old were you when you when you came, David? Eight. I was eight you years were old. Eight. So, I mean, you were old, you know, older. Like, I'll say, uh, you, you came as, as a kid, yeah. you know, like a baby. So there's, not a baby. And, and where, where did you first land when you, when you got here? I came in 1980. I was part of the last uh, group of, uh, you know, political prisoners were being... Uh, oh, okay loud asylum in the country. My dad was a political prisoner in Cuba. So we flew in and then it was in January. I think Mariel was like two months later. Like we would have been in Mariel if we hadn't got a visa. You know what I mean? Wow. That you came at the same time I came because I actually was born there too. I came when I was a year old and um, we came like in February, a couple of months before the Mariel boat lift. Right before. Yeah. So when you say you came from Cuba in 1980, everybody assumes I was in the Maria. <laughs> that was like a, a major offense. But I mean, I yeah, I one of Marielito. That was like a bad word, you know. Yeah. And, and when I was a kid, I remember like I remember defending myself. No, no, I flew here. I flew here. Yeah. But it, it was a thing. Like now, as an adult, you realize the things that you when you were a kid. It's just it's so. So now that we're talking a little bit about your like background in terms of you know your parents were born and raised in Cuba, you know Cubans are not necessarily the most open people when it comes down to like the arts and acting and modeling and creatives. So you were a very successful model and um, or are and one of your like you were one of your more iconic um, I guess pictures or campaign was the male with um, from John Paul here. So, how did that conversation go down with, like, your family? Like, when you showed them these, like, very artistic <laughs> pictures, you know, how did that go down? <laughs> I mean, eventually they were, I, mean, I think they were always proud, you know. For me, modeling was like, I was, I'd been in the military, I didn't work out, I came back home, I signed myself up in Miami Dade, so I was going to school, I had, like, two, three jobs, you know, I had Sunday was my only day off. I worked at nightclubs, so I barely slept. And I had a girlfriend who had dated a big model and had a really good friend who was a model. And she'd been telling me, like, listen, you should do this on the side. You can make some extra money. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be so hard. And, you know, after like a long time, ah, it's not for me. It's not for me. I can't imagine me in my underwear. But no way. And and then, and then finally one day I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give this a shot. Go. I saw, she showed me a, um, a receipt of one of her friend's checks. I'm like, he made that much money? I'm like, all right, cool, I'll try it. <laughs> so, so I was a big dude then, so I lost all this weight and I went, took a picture and, you know, one of my first gigs was like uh, Versace carrying Christy Turlington on the beach in Miami. Wow. And I didn't even know who Versace was. Like I was, I was clueless to any of this, you know? So, Things just kind of happened because, and this is, I also was lucky that this is when uh, fashion kind of blew up in Miami. It was like the early 90s, yeah. things started, you know, it was it was a scene, you know, and I was in that scene. It just so happens. Um, and and modeling was always something that I had one foot in, one foot out. Like I was always, I, I, I would drop classes because I'd make all this money, but then I'd sign up again and then I couldn't make it because I got these jobs and I got to fly somewhere. And I'm like, you know what? I, my best friend, actually, um, I asked him one day, I was like, dude, what do I do, man? I'm not going to ever going to finish school. And I wanted to like, I wanted to get it done. I didn't want to be in school forever. And uh, he's like, listen, you know, you made last year what I'm going to make when I'm done. Why don't you just give this a shot and try it out? Mm-hmm. And, you know, my best friend, he's, he's always been the voice of reason for me. So I was like, done. So I dropped out and then it just kind of took off. Like one thing after another happened. And I, I think it's like, bait. Hey, I don't know. I can't explain it. I never, I never aspired to be it. I never went for it. I didn't, you know, I, I was the kind of person that took care of myself and I liked to work out. So I had a, you know, good body, but that's it. 
That's it. What did your mom think of your first underwear shot, though? I was always embarrassed. My mom, my grandmother, especially. Yeah. <laughs> my grandmother was this. My grandmother, rest in peace. She's, rest in peace. She's, she, she was the best. She was the most loving grandma. But she was this. You didn't mess with her. Like she would, if you, if, if you like mess with her too much, she, she'd do like this to you. You know, she'd pull her arm back like she was gonna slap you. I was scared of her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, grandmothers. Um, that's why I was always curious of that because you know your your the pictures you did were very famous or very iconic and and very artistic and I always thought like man like if I was if I was here like coming home and showing my parents not that there was anything wrong with the pictures but you know they don't see them in like the artistic way they'll be like yeah, why are you in your underwear like you know. <laughs> I, I I didn't even I didn't even discuss that with them for a long 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 time you know. Eventually Eventually, I, I find out that they're proud of me, you know, but I, I didn't, I wasn't proud of me. I didn't think it was like this huge accomplishment. All I knew is that, you know, the more recognition you make, the more money you make. Of course. I just wanted to make money. I was like, okay, listen, if, you're, if my rate's going to go up because I did this badass, you know, a designer's ad, then awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm in. But it wasn't, I was never, I was never in a fashion. I was never in a, I guess it was a different time because I, I think that kids nowadays are more connected with the internet and all yeah. that. So they, or back then, I didn't. We had, like to, go, said, we, we had to go buy magazines to learn those things. We didn't have the internet. Right. Yeah. Like, my magazines were comics or muscle and fitness later on when I started <laughs> working out. <laughs> well, speaking of comics, thank you for setting me up there, David. That was a great segue. Yeah. Um, so actually, and, then, and listen, I will be. You and I will figure out how to make like a Marvel X Men podcast because I'm looking at that Wolverine in your in the background there at your gym. And I, <laughs> listen, fanboy and and Guano, you know what? That's 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 a market right there. We'll figure it out later. But Melissa, I was about to call you Amy. You. <laughs> Okay, it happens all the time, and I'm flattered by it. <laughs> you have a project coming out now on Hulu. Um, mm -hmm. It's a voiceover. Uh, I don't know if to call it like a show, a cartoon, uh, and you know, I, 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 it defies description, shall we say? Yes. Um, <laughs> so, an animated. Thank you, and I'm, I'm David. I'm gonna keep you around adult just to, just to set me up. Series. Yes. Adult you should though. clarify the adult. Do not watch this chil this with your children. Yes, and it is starring. <laughs> Uh, Modok. So, for those who don't aren't too familiar with the Marvel universe, he is a villain. He's essentially a floating head that has arms and ears sticking out of him. And mm -hmm. I have a massive soft spot for him because I think he's so ridiculous that how nobody came up to do an animated, you know, comedy series with this ridiculous-looking characters beyond me. But what can you tell us about you know about your role and and about the series? Yeah, well, what you thought is exactly what Patton Oswalt and our showrunner Jordan Blum thought as well. They were like, this character is so just hilarious just looking at him. He is like primed for comedy. And I think they were really intrigued by having a super villain as like the the main character of a show, but also like what does he do when he's not being a supervillain? And so this show is about where he goes at night when he's done fighting Iron Man and he goes home to his family and his family is messed up like every other family <laughs> because he is a supervillain. So I play his daughter, Melissa. Um, who looks like him. Who looks like him. Oh. But she is like... Queen Bee at her school, like the most popular, she owns it. She is an aspiring supervillain herself. She bedazzles her robot chair and she knows it all. She's like the most confident teenager you've ever seen. Um, and really, but also just like really wants approval from her father, Modoc. Um, and yeah, it's the scripts were hilarious. The cast is incredible it's Patton Oswalt me Amy Garcia from Lucifer Ben Schwartz from Parks and Rec John Daly Beck Bennett from SNL wow. um, Sam Richardson from Veep and I'm forgetting some people but um yeah it's it's incredible it's an incredible cast the scripts are so funny it's so it's funny and crass and vulgar and and it goes there so Those it's like a really different Marvel things. thing <laughs> yeah it's I it's it's different than everything else that's sort of Marvel that's out right now. Um, but it's a, it's a fun ride. So it comes out on May 21st on Hulu. So when you, 
with her work. Um, we're getting a lot of behind the scenes from like her soap opera days and now voiceover work. Um, when you do voiceover work, you go in and obviously you speak your lines, but is like other stuff already pre-recorded from the other voiceover actors or like do you do it all in, at the same time to feed off of each other? How does that work? No, so I actually recorded Modoc while I was shooting Brooklyn. So I my schedule was like had to be around my Brooklyn schedule when I could go in to record. So I didn't get to record with any of the actors. I think some of the other actors did get to have some sessions together. Um, so I recorded all my lines by myself. Occasionally they would be able to play me something that Patton had recorded, but mostly it was like throwing a lot of blind faith and trust in Jordan and the team on the, you have director in the, in the outside the booth you have a director and you have jo Jordan or showrunner would the be show there runner. for every and he would read the scenes with me um and so yeah and then sometimes you you're also just like taking line by line and doing like different versions of it because in animation you also record your performance before the animation is done so like your performance right. kind of informs the animation um, so you have a bit more freedom in that sense. Um, and it's really fun. And But yeah, it's like a lot of trust in the people that are behind the glass when you're in the booth um, and are, you know, giving you adjustments or, and a lot of times they're having, you know, so this is, how, and it's, this explodes behind you and, you know, and then this Iron Man swoops in and yeah, and you kind of have to imagine it all in your head and, and you know, try to get it across in your voice. So, but they're, they're really good at what they do. So yeah. Hey, it, it now that you did voiceover work, I mean, you're ready to be a podcast host. Like that's it. Like <laughs> I know I got my microphone. That's I'm true. ready. <laughs> Oh, tough, tough stuff. What we do, huh? Yeah. No, but you know what? Like sometimes, you know, we will obviously, as an audience, we see all these things, and you know, it's stuff that we wonder, like how, like the, the thing with voiceovers. Like I've always wondered: Do you get in like a room, or, like all of you together, um, or do you just do it on your own? Now, you mentioned a uh, uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine again. So, you guys have already shot, and have you finished shooting? This is a final season, right? This is the final season. We're about halfway through. We just wrapped on episode five, um, shooting episode six this week, and we're doing ten. Um, so, yeah, we have about a month and some left. So maybe we'll see it in the fall, maybe? Uh... Yeah, I'm not quite sure if it's going to be fall or winter, um, but I'm guessing NBC will announce that soon. I'm, I'm sure you guys are going to run with a bang. <laughs> Yeah, they're yeah. I think they they have some some fun stuff planned for you know to celebrate the final season, celebrate our run. We're all really proud to have made it this far and done this many seasons, and and it's also I think just really lovely. And what we all wanted was to be able to end it and say when we're ending it and right. like enjoy this sort of victory lap. So. Um, we feel that on set with these episodes and there's a lot of like nostalgic moments happening on set and, uh, and we're just all really grateful that, you know, we get to end it on our terms. That's awesome. That's awesome. So David, there's something I have to ask you. <laughs> uh oh, I know where this is going. So I am a huge Mariah Carey fan, like huge. <laughs> so I have to ask you about the video for Honey. Like, I, 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 I can't let this interview go by without asking you about that. So. Notice, notice how he waited, how we were, like, at the tail end of the interview, too. He's yeah, like... I, I don't know how that may go down. Maybe he goes down, like, oh! <laughs> I don't know how, how that may go down. Um, so, how, how did that happen? How, how did that happen, and how was that process? Okay, so what I've heard, the story... Of how how I got this, what I heard back then. This is this is what I talk. You know, it's like just being in the right place at the right time. Fate. Supposedly, Mariah had um, a hairstylist who recommended me and kept pushing and said, "You got to use this guy for your video." And someone I worked with uh, a bunch of times. I remember I remember his face. I, I don't remember his name. So. I was in Europe, it was, it was uh, the fashion shows in Milan, and I get a call, you know, we got the Mariah Carey video, they want to use you, 
and you know you just got to get here i'm like look i just got here i got a job tomorrow there's no way i can do it so they kept calling back and like no we need you right away david you you got to do this final i was like yeah i mean shit if they want me that bad hell hell yeah i'll do it so i had to cancel everything that i, I was doing in, in europe they flew me they flew me from milano to paris from paris i took the concord which doesn't exist anymore to new york and then from new york i took a plane to puerto rico where we shot it yeah. I was there for like four days shooting it. Um, I could have been there longer, but then I had to leave for another job back in Europe. I wish I could have stayed, but it was the most amazing job. First of all, Mariah was amazing. Her crew, the, everyone she surrounded herself with was so pleasant. And, and, and it's just a great day in Puerto Rico. And when I first got there, I remember they told me, it's like, listen, just go. They gave me a, a card and they said, just you know, make yourself comfortable because we know you just flew in from Europe. Uh, get some sun, hang out by the beach. We're going to shoot tomorrow. So I had this, so I got myself set up by the pool. I ordered a drink. I just flown all this way. And I, it, I shit you not, this is the way it happened. I pick up my drink and I take a sip of my drink. I put my drink down and I look up and there's Miss Puerto Rico beauty pageants surrounding the pool practicing. <laughs> they were practicing a pageant, I guess it was coming up. And I remember I was 23. Can you imagine sitting there by the pool watching these beautiful Puerto Rican girls thinking, like, this is the life, man. <laughs> I scored. I scored. Melissa, is, the is, that, is, is that that player you had heard about? I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, come on. It's, the reputation comes from somewhere. <laughs> We've all been 23 before. Come on. <laughs> no, that's true. If I was 23 and Mr. Puerto Rico was practicing at the pool, I would have been like, okay. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> And then, and then that job, the Mariah Carey video, led to One Like to Live, because that's how I got One Like to Live. One of the oh, producers wow. got in the video, and then I got this and, 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 and because, sorry, because you brought up Honey, I also have to insert that. Oh, yeah, that story. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I was like 13 when, when Honey came out, like 13 or 14, and I was obsessed with the hot guy at the end of the video. Wow. I wish I would have known that early on. I this was back that. in like MTV days, right? So like sometimes they would cut the end of the video short, right? To go to yeah. TRL. So I remember like, you know, you'd run home from school and you'd like go put MTV on to watch videos. And I would get so mad when they would cut Honey short because the hot guy at the end of the video. And I freaked out. And then when I met David, it wasn't, like Google wasn't out yet. So like I couldn't Google him. So I had no idea who his past and that he had been in this video. And then, yeah. So I when your kids are older and they ask you, mommy, what was the first time you saw dad? You were like, at the end of the honey video. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, 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 he's like, carrying Mariah Carey and Frelke on a beach and he looks But, cool. but it goes with what you're saying that, you know, about like, being at the right place in the right time and luck because that, I mean, at the time you probably didn't realize it or didn't know that that would end up becoming probably her most iconic video um, because that's, that is by far her most famous video and it was, you know, the change, the first video that was like the major change in her career. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's like, I mean, I'm sure that within the Mar Mariah Carey, like Lamb family, as they call it, and like fans, like, you know, everybody knows who you are. It's like, oh, it's the guy from the Honey video. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For better or for worse. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've been very lucky, man. I've been very lucky. Yeah. Uh, well, I know you guys got to go because I know, like I mentioned earlier, you, know, you guys are parents. You got to go take care of the, the, the little youngins. But I just, again, I want to, you know, that de la gracia, like, quite frankly, it's, it's one of those things where we, we always talk about our, our, our wish list. Um, and I will say that, you know, you guys have always been on the wish list of like, you know, well, maybe one day we'll get them on the show. Maybe one day we'll get them on the show. And so, you know things manifest when you when you put it out into the universe so I, you know yeah, man. thank you thank you for for stopping by our, our little podcast we really do appreciate no, and, it and, and congratulations to you guys you know it's there's a there's a certain like cuban thing that i remember when i when i was flying around europe i would run into cubans from cuba at like a restaurant i could hear them a mile away and it was the coolest thing to come up to them and say so cubano Hey, you'd hang out like that's the coolest thing. And the same thing in this country, even though we've been here forever. This is, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, this is my country, you know, but it always, when you hear about Cubans doing well, or when you meet a Cuban, uh, 
it's just a, it's a cool thing. So congratulations to you guys. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of Cuban pride. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And listen, next time you're in Miami, if we don't meet up at Besaya for a cabecito, I'm just saying, you know, I, then, <laughs> then we may not have, we may not start our X-Men podcast, David. That's all I'm saying, if we don't have the cafe. Okay. Cafecito y don't forget una, una caja de pastelito and y, y, y pan cubano. Croquetas. That's oh my, my thing. When, when I go down to Miami, I go to the bake. I don't do it anymore because now I usually go down to the Keys now. But when I used to go down to Miami all the time, I, that's the first one of the first things I would do. I'd go to the bakery, fill up a box with pastries, cuatro libra de pan, and one of them would go down by the time I got to the house. I was yeah. Yeah. He's talking, take one. he's talking shit. I don't know what he does that. Well, you don't, you don't I was going to say, you figure it out. Way you to find a the way keys, to do it. Uh, and I'm going to say, I'm gonna say this very clearly. No joda. On the way to Los Cayo, I, I mira, I Ricky, I Pinecrest, I de todo. O sea, I, yeah. I, I know you're stopping. No, no. Brother, okay? You know where to stop. You know where to stop. Or you go for a drive. Well, I, think, I think it was last year I found out they had a Cuban bakery down there now, too. So Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's over. Over. Pinecrest is Done. on the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, thank you, guys. <laughs> and we're back. They were so fun. They were. They were great. They, they were like. Were, they were really good. I, you, you know, in retrospect, she couldn't stop giggling. Yeah, like you, the whole and, time. And, like, you know, in, in retrospect, specifically about David, is that you know David was like. Uh, a big time fashion model yeah, for yeah, all these yeah, yeah, fashion yeah. houses and we always have this perception of models that they take themselves so seriously and they're yeah. so like oh you know like, oh, I'm a model I'm a model yeah. and he like he couldn't have been more like whatever I mean <laughs> like, what he's Bunkoano yeah but you know you know what you know what, what what I did love about them as a couple is that you know they're they've both been very successful they've had again very high end yeah, very, jobs and, and very roles, recognizable. Right. And they seemed so like, hey, you wanna go uh <laughs> if they had told me that they live in Kendall, I'd believe it. They seem so like down to earth and so yeah. just like average average, average people. people. Yeah. Yeah. Average it, it's like, oh and you know you you guys are like have really iconic things to your yeah. name. Yeah. <laughs> so um I freaking love Brooklyn Nine Nine. It's, it's okay, I'm I'm okay. She, she's great. I'm a huge Andy Samberg fan. Yeah, um, but everybody on that show is just like on all cylinders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the interview couldn't end without me asking him about Mariah Carey. <laughs> As you like, just heard, it didn't end like, without you asking like, about Mariah. And I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be very respectful about it because you know, like I'm sure that he probably at, at one time got a lot of right, you right, know, right. So I don't want to be like that person to be like, oh my god, give me the scoop, you know? Right. No, and what if he didn't have a good experience for whatever right, reason, right. or you know? But, but it's like, man, I'm one degree now from Mariah. Carey. You are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> We'll work and, on and, that. And, and, and in the Mariah Carey universe of videos, Honey is her most iconic video. And, you know, and he's probably her most, like, I- iconic, iconic and well-known. Yeah, co-star. Yeah. So so that was, that was a fun one. That was yeah. a fun one. So. I mean, when I think of the most iconic Mariah co-stars, it's him and the Marimba from Glitter. La Marimba from Glitter. Hey, listen, Glitter had its, its comeback. Yes, true. Although Glitter, you know, it's either the Marimba or the Silver Streak. Those are the most iconic the ones that did coaster. That, that had their moment that didn't have their moment. <laughs> that didn't have their moment. So uh, anyway, bueno, all this made me thirsty. Are you thirsty? Do you want to go first? Or do you want I'll to go, go first. first. Okay. So my last soda goes this week to Naomi Osaka. Uh, from the French Open? Yes. So for those of you who don't know Naomi Osaka, you should. <laughs> she is one of I didn't the, know who she was till this week. Really? I don't follow tennis. But she's one of the highest paid athletes in the world and she's like a total badass how many times have you heard me talk about sports okay anyway um so she for those of you who don't know uh she is a tennis player but she is very successful she won several championships she's one of the highest paid athletes in the world um her idol was serena williams going uh, growing up and and um they've actually had matches against each other mm. and um she's very young um i forget how old she is but she's very young and she i think she's 23 um but basically they were in the french open this week mm-hmm. and she had made i believe she had made it into the finals and yeah. she asked to that she did not want to do the press conference after right the match and 
they were like, no, you have to. One thing led to another, right. and she quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, there's been people, of course, because there's people who have opinions <laughs> because about it's everything. 2021. Um, who are like, oh, you know, she's entitled and this ungrateful, and that, you know, and ungrateful and blah blah blah. And I'm like, listen, she is a tennis player. She's not a media person. And right. if if her uh, because he apparently the thing with she with, suffers from like anxiety or something. Yes, right? the thing about the um, press conferences. Mm -hmm. It's specifically for tennis after an open is that it's not about like asking questions like, oh, how did you feel going in today? And right. You know, how'd you what, prepare or, right. or whatever? It was they ask you questions about your plays. Oh, you did this and this and this. Like, why did you do that? Oh, okay, 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 okay. So they are on li like live TV. Like on in real time, you have to go back and dissect your match, which you you're weren't exhausted even thinking. Yeah. mentally and physically. Right. And she said that. For mental health reasons, for for her yeah. own health, she did not feel comfortable doing that, and they didn't respect her wishes, and she walked out. She left. She left yeah, the tournament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, it goes back to one of those things that, and, and we've talked about it here on for different um, subjects. When somebody's telling you something, believe them. You need to believe them and shut up and listen. If the yeah. girl is telling you that she does not want to do the press conferences because it makes her feel uncomfortable, it may you know gives it her anxiety, her, it gives mental her anxiety, health, yeah. then freaking listen to her and don't make her do the press conference. It's like, don't worry, boo. Most people are tuning in to watch the match. Yeah, nobody's really tuning in for the the post for the supposed soundbite, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 you know. Um, I think Serena Williams had kind of like the best answer. You know, she, she they were they asked her, you know, because of this, they asked right. her. So how do you feel about this? And she's like, oh, you know, I totally support her decision. Right. You know, if, if, if she feels bad about it, you know, I feel bad for her that she feels right, bad about right, it. Right. But the way that I handle it is that I know that nobody in that room can play like me or do the serves that I do <laughs> or the plays that I do. So because I am better than them and they can't even touch me, I don't let them get to me. And I was like, oh yeah, you gotta, <laughs> that's a mic drop moment. You gotta give her, you gotta give, you gotta give her credit. That's a self-confidence moment right that, there. I mean, that's that, a healthy yeah. dose of self-confidence. Yeah, I mean, she is, as our friend would say, she is the best, but that's something that only she could say. Like, right, 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 right. She's like the best, but, um, but it's like, yeah, you know, good for her. Good for her. Putting that, herself first. That she put herself first and her mental health first. Yeah, absolutely. And was like, fuck this. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, screw you, French Open. So, um, so yeah, my soda goes off to her. Soda goes to her. Well, that's great. Yeah, I mean, mental health. Listen, mental health, only you know your own mental health. And only yeah. you can be your own advocate. Yeah. And if you're not going to do it, who is? And only you can stop forest fires. It's I mean. true. You and Smokey the Bear. So my last soda is actually for something that's a little somber. Um, so we're in Pride Month, and I'm actually going to try to give a last soda every week to something Pride related. And the first one that I'm giving it to is an Instagram page that I actually think everybody should follow or at least take a look at. It's called um, the AIDS Memorial. And what it is, it's, you know, as we sit here and talk about pride and you have to know your history and what has come before and, you know, how far we've come and still so far to go and all that, you know, there is an entire generation of, of gay men who are just gone. Mm -hmm. You know, they never had the chance to see the progress. They never had the chance to grow old. And so this profile, what it is, is people post, I, I guess they share it to whoever the, the, the gatekeepers of the, of the profile and they provide them with like I mean, I'm showing you like very lengthy stories mm -hmm. about each person. about a person, and they'll provide like a picture or two and things like that. And you know, each um, each post ends with the hashtag "What is remembered lives." Oh, that is true. And that is so very true. I, you know, I I follow this page because it's a good reminder of you know, as 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 much work as we have to do and all of this and that. You know what? There's an entire generation of of people who are not here to see it. Yeah, and 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 we have to recognize the the advances that have been made, and 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 but never forget. Yeah, the, what whose shoulders who, you whose shoulders on. you stood on. You, and and I think that one of the <clears throat> biggest issues with 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 that with what you're saying of like this whole like generation. I don't know if generation is the right word, but this whole group of yeah. of people that kind of vanished is that. These were people that when they died, and, and let's, let's kind of say between the 1980s. Late 80s, early 90s. Early 90s. Mm -hmm. That they died and they were sort of seen as pariahs. Yeah. 
You know, it's not like, oh my gosh, it's it, it's not, they, they weren't met with the compassion that we eventually right, right. came around with right. and were like, oh my gosh, you're, di- you know, you're dying of, of HIV or AIDS. Because yeah. even by the time Pedro Zamora came around, which was 94, 95, I feel there had been advance, because I remember when- Once when- Elizabeth Taylor got involved- Attitudes started changing. But, but I remember but, that but, when, when Pedro Zamora died, yeah, there was, was a, thing. a big, you know, outcry for him and, and compassion right, right. for him. But it's what you were that. saying earlier. But People it was got to know him. You got to know him. And it was also probably like 10, 12 years into it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and we've come a long way since he died in 95. But even in 95, right. I think it was leaps and bounds from where we were in 89 we were in, in, in 84 85 right. because like these men specifically that were dying in in the 80s they were seen as like less than yeah no and, you were and, you were sent off somewhere to and, die and, and 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 you know and not to like beat a dead horse and not to like you know bring up stuff from the past but we are <laughs> um <laughs> you know a lot of people love ronald reagan you know ronald reagan yeah. Reagan, he, he, accompli- he accomplished. He accomplished all a these lot. things. He has all these merits. You know, the walking down, all that stuff. But one of the things that the Reagan administration has really their stock they, has really they, gone they screwed down the pooch. is that the Reagan administration, the first, I believe, the first slew of people that died from AIDS were in 1981. Mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan did not publicly say anything about AIDS until 1987. Yeah. Six years later. Like, what the hell were like you right. doing? And I understand that at the beginning nobody knew what it was. And they right, 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 out, right, right. And you know, I understand all that. So maybe he wasn't gonna like do a knee-jerk reaction and come out. Right, right, right. But it's like, okay, I could understand maybe a couple of months or even a right. year, but like right. six over six years. Man. You know, that you just stood there. Can you imagine all the people that maybe either could have been saved or their quality of life, at been, least yeah. at the end, improved. could have been improved? Yeah. Because, like, these people are being left to die like they were dogs because nobody wanted to treat them. Nobody wanted to no, deal you with were them. Quarant- you, you want to talk about a quarantine. Yeah. So, I, again, it's all those things that you have to look back and you have to see things. So, you know what? From... Give me all of the pride shit at Target. Yes. <laughs> because it's, we've come a long way, baby. Okay. So. I like that you said Target. Like, no, because the, 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 the little display is really cute. Like I went by the other day. You can see, you can even see it from the door of the little Target and Coral Gables. Not the, the little, the little Target. Yeah. Oh, is that that little one? Well, that used, all it, one it used to be an Office Depot. That is a little Target. It's a little Target. It's a mini Target. But I love my okay. mini Target. Does the mini Target have everything Target has, but just in less quantities? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it does. It even has a Starbucks. Okay. So it's just <laughs> less quantity. Yes. It's not like... Right. Okay. We don't have sports stuff. Right. But they'll have like a can of tennis balls. Right. Not... <laughs> Five different brands. Right, right, okay. right, right, right. The little Target. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you boy all is the it time. still called Target or is it called like no, Petite Target? No, no. <laughs> Petite Target? No. Um, no, it's still Target. So, but yes, so the AIDS Memorial. Oh, yeah, and page. I have to tell you something. Our learn segment on this show, on this episode. There was a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> I'm glad Melissa and David kind of, you know, livened it up, it up a little, little bit. bit. Yeah, because yeah, there yeah. was a lot to learn, but hey, that's yeah. why you roll with us here at Petrolemon. That's why you come you, back week after week, you baby. You listen, laugh, and learn. Sometimes we laugh, sometimes we learn, and sometimes we drink <laughs> coffee. <laughs> you drink coffee. I drink coffee and you watch me. Yes. I watch you drink coffee. Yes. So, with that said, everybody, <laughs> we hope you listen, laugh, and learn. Remember to grab your patelito your croqueta and your cafecito and thank you so much for joining us have a great great weekend everybody yes enjoy um, and that was episode 159 Nine. Nine. Oh wow getting close to 200 Pero Let Me Tell You is co-hosted by Darian Borges and Ismaeliano produced by Ismaeliano and our theme Pero Let Me Tell You Freestyle is composed by Michael Angelo Lomlaplex the official gay guy and don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on itunes 